All right. Hey, good morning and a brand new week and a brand new book study. Hope you guys had a great weekend and um, looking forward to the week that's, that's coming our way. It's uh, time change, so it'll be getting dark at like lunch today and and then we'll have to wander around in blindness of the dark or whatever. I, I, I joke, but uh, man, I'm that's not a fan of how dark it gets so fast. But um, man, what a great weekend we had! I hope you had one. Uh, Friday, we uh, uh, Jackson and Rachel and Tammy and I took off and headed up to to Nashville for the day and uh, Franklin and hung out with my my middle son, his wife, my three uh, incredible grandsons, and just had a, a really an incredible time. Uh, walking the streets of Franklin, looking at their new house they're building up there, hanging out uh, with family. There's nothing like it. And so we, uh, we're we at the age of life where we, we chase our family. They're, they're busy, and I remember what that's like. So uh, we try to make a trek to Nashville uh, once a month, and we try to get to Peachtree City, my oldest son there. And uh, we get to see my uh, son, my young son Jackson, uh, a good bit, and then Abby, who lives not too far from us, uh, we travel and see them probably a couple times a week, watching basketball and other things. So, uh, but man, Saturday, I mean Friday was great. Saturday, uh, we just hung out at the house. Uh, we only did a walk. We walked a good bit uh, Saturday morning, and then uh, watching football. Uh, the Tamsters trying to get over a cold, and so we just kind of <clears throat> hung out Saturday and did that Sunday. Church was uh, amazing. Uh, I, I love our body of, of believers that gather together. And church was good. We celebrated the Lord's Supper together. We had uh, a feast uh, afterwards of just hanging out, and we do that every first Sunday. And uh, man, just an amazing time. And then, uh, man, ready to rock and roll today with you guys. We are in Second Timothy, brand new book. And there is nothing to me that's more fun than uh, beginning and launching a, a new study. And so I have taught uh, bits and pieces through this. I have taught this in a mini session uh, over in Nagpur, India, a few times, and uh, in the seminary there, uh, but but not not like this. And so it's just rich. Now let me kind of set the setting for us today. That's what we're going to get to. Uh, so we just finished First Timothy. Uh, a few years have gone by. Uh, the exact number of that is somewhat up for debate, depending on on how you chart uh, some of the geography of Paul and his journeys. Uh, but at any rate, uh, he's this is a, a, it's probably two or three years uh, span that, that separated these letters. And Paul is sitting in a, a dungeon in Rome. Uh, this is his last letter. Now, I think he probably knows that uh, because he said the time of my departure is near, but yet he has said that for quite a while in some of his other writings. But this is the last letter Paul wrote. I want, to, I want to take a little bit of time and just let us see kind of the life of Paul and, and the importance of this letter. And so if you will, we're going to kind of journey all over the place today. So just sit back. We are going to look at, at 2 Timothy verse 1 and 2, but then it's going to be near the end of what we do. So um, Nero, around 64 A.D., um, the city of Rome burned. Most historians blame Nero for it. Nero blames the Christians. Intense persecution came. Uh, they became the scapegoat. And so intense persecution. Paul is caught up in that. Peter's already passed away. Paul is um, is in prison. If you were to go to Rome, uh, you could see this um, uh, the ruins of it. There's it's a it's just a dungeon in a sense. It's a it's a hole in the ground, manhole cover. They would put him in and out of there. He's um, well beyond his middle-aged years. He's in his late 60s as he writes this. Uh, he says, and I'm going to read a little bit of what's happening in 2 Timothy just so we kind of get a flavor for it. He says he's in chains. Um, you know that my, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Philgelius and Hermogenes. So. Uh, Paul is, is alone. Everyone's deserted him. He says this a couple of times. So if we were to start back in uh, the book of, of Acts where uh, Paul began his journey, you remember that he was breathing out, the scripture says in Acts chapter 9, murderous threats against the way. He was a Jew, a, a, a Jew of Jews. He was a leader among leaders persecuting the church. He did not believe Jesus was the Messiah, and he was determined to follow Jehovah in all his ways, and he was a devout Jew. 
uh, ignorant but devout Jew, a man of faith, and uh, and so he's ch he's gotten a letter so that it lets him just chase the way uh, these these believers in the false Messiah in his mind all over the place. He's on the road to Damascus, and you know the story. Uh, it says, meanwhile, while he was doing all of this. Uh, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. He was an apostle, not by choice, but by God. And uh, a little later on, he says uh, he says to Ananias, no one wanted to speak to him and um the, the Lord in a dream told Ananias, I need you to go and, and uh, bring healing to his eyes and uh, spend some time with him. Ananias is going like, that's the guy that's been killing us. I'm pretty sure. No, I don't want to do that. And uh, he says, no, you're going to go. And I want you to tell him how much he is going to suffer for my name. So this is Paul, uh, probably in his, in his 30s. Uh, he has this experience. And then he has a, a, he's caught up into the third heaven. He has a dream and a vision, and he sees Jesus, the full scope of his life. So much so that it, it really gave him the, the uh, office of apostle because one had to have seen the risen Christ, lived and seen the risen Christ. And um, Paul did that by virtue of abstentia through a vision. Now, um, if we were to take the time, and I'm going to today, just read a little bit for you. Let me just list. Let me set you up for, for what's taking place in Second Corinthians. Um, Paul is speaking about his life, and he he says in verse seven, he says, "We have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us." Right? Do you remember when he speaks these things and he says this? We're hard pressed on every side, when well, I'm not crushed. He says, we're perplexed, but I'm not in despair. We're persecuted. I've never been abandoned. We're struck down. I'm not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us. But life, he says, is at work in you. God is in the process of, of causing us to die to self, but he's in the process of giving you life. And so, so this, is, this is where Paul is. And so he speaks about that. And he says, look, we don't, so therefore we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I want you to hear this picture before we see the setting of this last letter. He goes on in chapter 11, uh, verse 22, and he, he picks up some things and he says this. There's some people who are saying that they were better apostles than him. And he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind, he says, to talk like this. I can't believe I'm comparing and having to argue who's more uh, worthy to be called an apostle. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely and been exposed to death again and again. Five times, he says. I receive from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Five times I received from the Jews those things. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country. I've been in danger at sea and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and I have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst. I have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin, and I don't inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is to be praised forever, knows that I'm not lying. In Damascus, 
in the, the governor under King Artis and the city of Dama uh, Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. I was lured from a basket and I was slipped out through their hands. He, he's just telling us how difficult life is. From the moment that he met Jesus and he knew who he was, he became an apostle. He was feared at the beginning and then beloved at the end or in the middle and then left abandoned at the end. And so we see his journey and he speaks of all of the difficulties that he's had. And then, um, and then in, verse, in chapter 12, he goes on and he speaks of these surpassing um, dreams and so forth that he had. And he says, because of these surpassing great revelations... Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pled with the Lord to take it from me. But he said to me, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak then I'm strong. So here's the apostle. For 35 years, he has endured this kind of a life. He comes to the end of his life, as I spoke to you and told you this is his last letter, and I want you to hear now what where he is. He's in chains again. Probably not getting out of this one. Listen to what it says. Verse 15, chapter 1. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. Now, he's writing to Timothy, who's in Ephesus, which is in Asia, Asia Minor, which is the, the, the province of, of uh, Turkey. And he says, everyone in Asia, they've, they've all left me, Timothy, uh, including Phygelius and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. And so here's Paul in a hole in the ground. He says, man, everybody's forgotten me. Uh, Onesiphorus uh, because he refreshed me. He says, he, he, let me tell you one person who did, he says. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. So you imagine, here's this, here's this servant of the Lord coming in trying to find the Apostle Paul. No one is going to speak about him. No one wants to know where he is. And, and so he's just searching, going up this alley and going up that alley and knocking on this door, knocking on that door until somebody somewhere said, yeah, yeah, there's a dungeon and you'll find him there. And he finds him in chains. This is Paul. He was, um, he, he was with criminals, um, it, it says in, in verse 9. I am suffering even to the point of being chained like criminals, but God's word's not chained. He goes, man, here's, here I am. I'm in this hole in the ground, man. Sewage everywhere uh, from the streets of Rome. I can hear, I can smell the stench. I can hear the, the hustling and bustling. And here I sit in these chains uh, like a criminal. And then he says this in verse uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 6. He says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. Paul saying, look, man, I, I'm already, I, I'm spent, man. Every ounce of that I've got to love Christ is, um, I, I've, I've spent it. I, I'm, I'm being poured out. I, I'm just an offering uh, to the King of Kings. And, and I know that my time of departure is now. I know death is, is imminent on me. And then he, then he, he says to, to, to him this, he says, um, only Luke is with me. Um, let's see, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls. And so Paul's going, look, man, everybody's left me. I, I need you to come. Um, I, that's why I sent Tychicus to you, so that he would let you know this is why this is why he's bringing this letter. He said Luke's here uh, with me, but everybody else that they're gone, uh, and so he says bring bring John Mark with you. Now John Mark, with early on in his first missionary journey, uh, thought it'd be fun to travel with Paul and his um, his brother or his his um, uncle Barnabas, but he bailed on him in the beginning, and so. Uh, created quite a skirmish between Paul and Barnabas. And so Paul said, I don't have anything to do with John Mark. If you're going to take him, I'm gone. And so Paul took another partner. Barnabas took John Mark. We don't hear much of John Mark, but in the, in the, um, in history, we know that Barnabas spent time with him, that he spent time with the apostle Peter and Peter spent a, a 
ton of time with John Mark, so much so that Mark was the one who authored uh, the Gospel of Mark, who had it was transcribing from Peter's recollection of those times. But yet, now Paul says, but man, man he's valuable to me. And so he's saying, hey, bring, bring me that. Um, he says, you know, not, not even the, the churches in Asia Minor are with me. They've all abandoned me. Um, and so this is, this is where we, we find him. He's lonely, and he's missing Timothy. He's at the end of his life, and he's missing Timothy. And he says, please try to come and see me uh, bef before, before winter. Uh, and he says, uh, at my first offense, no one came to support me. Everyone deserted me. So here I'm in prison. They brought me out to trial, and I looked around, and I got, I've got no one. I've got no witnesses to, to vouch for me. I've, I, I've got nothing. And uh, he says, so Timothy, man, come on, can you come and can you bring me a coat? It's, it's, it's bitter down here. And could you bring some, some books? I'm, I'm still wanting to just love the Lord and learn more about him as I go. And then he says in, in the final greetings, he says, do your best to get here before winter. Uh, Eubulus greets you, and so do Putin's, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. And so he's got brothers and sisters there, but no, no true uh, fellow brothers partners in the gospel of Christ. And so this is this is where we find Paul. And so Paul writes this. It's 67 AD. Uh, he has, according to his own words, I have fought the good fight, he says, and I, I have kept the faith. I, I've been a good soldier for Christ. I, I've, I've been that I've been that warrior. I have not quit. And I'm not quitting now. In those these chains have me chained. They don't have the word change. And you believe me. I am I am transcribing and I am getting this stuff out. So in a sense, he knows that he's passing the torch to Timothy. Wants Timothy to get I don't believe Timothy made it to see him uh, because Paul passes away soon after this. He will give his head uh, to the to the chopping block and they will uh, they will cut his head off and so um, Paul is trying to pass the torch uh, to the next generation what I love about that is Paul's not concerned so much about his legacy uh, which tends to be the older you get you know you kind of want to make sure everybody remembers who you are and Paul's like man it doesn't matter who I am I, I'm determined that this ministry not fail I'm a, I've got the baton in my hand and I'm and I'm old and and my time is short and I'm not going to make it to the finish line uh, I'm going to make it to my finish line but the, but the work has to go on so here Timothy come grab the baton and and take it to this next generation and he's so he's saying and so this letter is a letter of hey don't quit don't don't you quit and so in this letter, he is motivating uh, Timothy to stay strong, to, to, not, to be fearless, to, to don't let fear creep in. And so if we just read the intro, we see here's a father giving instruction, not advice. This is authority. Listen to how he says it. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. He's still saying, hey, Timothy, I, I'm still breathing. I'm still in charge. And I've got work for you to do, and I'm ordering you to do these things in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. I'm an apostle in keeping with this promise of life that God gave to me and said in exchange for that life, you're going to be mine. And uh, he says to Timothy, my dear son. And uh, man, it, Paul, Paul was probably married and his wife left him when he, when he joined the way. The reason why I say that is because um, all those who are part of the Sanhedrin were to be married. Some say that law was a little uh, later than when Paul was, but others don't. And so we can make the assumption that, that Paul most likely was married, but no kids. And uh, so Timothy is his son. And of all the ones he worked with, Timothy is that one. And so he is in that sense passing the torch. And here's what he says, and we'll leave you with this. Paul, a dying man, looks at Timothy, his son, and says, Listen, I'm an apostle. I've got work for you to do. This isn't advice, son. This is authority speaking. I'm telling you what to do. But before I do, I want you to hear this. Grace be yours. May God lavish you with more than you can imagine. Mercy. May you realize that God has has forgiven you of, of and far greater things than you deserve. And may the peace that comes from that, from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord, may that be yours. May you be at peace. 
just like I am, Timothy. May you fight the good fight. That's the message for today. Can't wait to jump into this book with you tomorrow as we uh, as we uncover all of these great truths that we're going to see as we walk through the last letter of, of the great Apostle Paul. Lord bless you guys. Have a good day. Lord willing, I'm going to see you in the morning.